Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Andrew King is here, a modern bar barnstormer with just amazing stories, and his life story in itself is absolutely fantastic. So I cannot wait to get to that part of the show. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, Social Flight's Fly to Win Challenge is in full swing. We just gave away an Aspen E5 electronic flight instrument to Connor Bolin of Asbury, New Jersey. He has a 1971-72K and is getting ready to install that. And so we are always giving things away. And on October 1st, we're giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. It's just one more prize in this ongoing series. All you need to do is get the Social Flight app, mobile app for Apple or Android devices, uh, and you just uh, get it, go to the Fly to Win Challenge, get set up, and that's it. And it, it will automatically check you in at airports. Even if you only go to your home airport, even if you only check in at one airport during the prize period, you are entered in to win from our prize drawing. And if you fly to multiple airports and build points and compete on our leaderboard, you can get extra entries into our Fly to Win Challenge and increase your chances to win. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Continental Aerospace Technologies. Continental has been a strong supporter of Social Flight, making all of this possible, the app, everything possible, to help support general aviation. And I can tell you I fly behind a Continental engine, uh, Continental cylinders when I did a top overhaul, and even had Continental's services group down in uh, Fairhope, Alabama, do the work on the aircraft, and it was absolutely spectacular and just gives me such confidence in flying the plane. So big thank you and shout out to Continental. And also, uh, I'd like to show you something. We've uh, made a change. Uh, I recently um, got an update to the uh, panel of the aircraft where we installed uh, PS Engineering's PMA 350C audio panel. You can see it here at the top. It's a, a really terrific audio panel that now gives us 3D audio, basically. The, the idea that you can hear one radio coming from the two o'clock position, another radio coming from the 10 o'clock position. And uh, it, it's, it's really been helpful when doing a lot of cross-country flying in very busy airspace um, to being able to, to understand all of that. And it has so many other features as well, uh, all on this digital LCD screen. And so uh, just, uh, I've been uh, friends with them for such a, a long time. They just make fantastic products. And so just wanted to include a, a shout out to promote uh, PS Engineering. If you're thinking about an audio panel or anything for your audio, uh, be sure to check them out. The other thing is, by the way, this new audio panel gives us a great capability to have both audio from music devices and then at the same time a second Bluetooth input that comes from the iPad with warnings. So when we are flying behind um, our iFly EFB and it has like airspace warnings or things like that, it all can come right through the audio panel and tell you that you're coming up on an airspace or there's something else that you need to know. So it's been uh, absolutely a lot of fun and just wanted to share that with you. Now to tonight's guest. Andrew King is a modern day barnstormer. He grew up and honed his craft at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome, a place that is very special to me because it's also near where I grew up and it kicked off my own fascination with flying. If you have never been there, the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in upstate New York features weekly air shows and displays of some of the most iconic antique aircraft in the world, including the Fokker triplane. I mean, you just can't get more iconic than that and and it's just amazing to get to see these aircraft up close on a regular basis every sunday you can go out and see this air show and it has a story that goes with it it's just a ton of fun andrew is well is he's a well-known expert in flying and restoring some of the rarest vintage aircraft on the planet since 1978 he's accumulated over 5,000 hours in 155 different types of aircraft and has the distinction of having flown pre-1950s classic aircraft in all 50 states. He's also an AMP with an IA. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, there are just few things in aviation as pure as the stick and rudder skills required to command the classic planes that started it all off. So I am absolutely thrilled to have Andrew with us here tonight. I'm going to bring him on the line now. And uh, please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Andrew King. How are you doing, Andrew? 
I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you. Good to be here. So your story fascinates me, and, and there's such a wonderful, warm, personal connection there in going back to old Rhinebeck. I, I, I want to start with letting people know, who, if anyone, if you haven't been there, what this place is, because it seems to me remarkably unique as a, as a place for the kind of birth of aviation. It, it really is. Uh, it, it was a magical place to grow up. Uh, my dad and my uncle were involved. My brother is still involved there, so it was kind of a family thing for our family. And there are a few other places in the world where they fly vintage airplanes and display them like the Shuttleworth in England. But Rhinebeck, uh, Cole Palin, who was the founder of Rhinebeck, in kind of a stroke of genius, decided that he was going to make it sort of like a Saturday afternoon matinee movie and have a hero and a villain and have a skit that went along with the whole show. And I, I think that's what makes it really unique and, and that's what draws in. It's not just a bunch of uh, uh, mostly male airplane geeks that go there. It's it's entertainment for a family. It's it's more like a like say a kind of a Saturday afternoon matinee movie. And it also then gives the excuse to show off poker triplanes and soft with pops and things like that and and the other vintage aircraft. Yeah, it, it's it really is just fascinating. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up uh, an image of it for people to see. A couple things that 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 uh, talk about it and. I, I love that, that it's a it's a story. It's like going to see a play. They, there's a whole storyline. There's things on the ground that happen. There's things in the air. And all uh, every aspect of it is all about these amazingly classic antique aircraft. Well, and there's audience participation. The audience is encouraged to boo the villain and cheer for the hero and stuff. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, just a kind of a good old-fashioned Americana experience. What type of planes do they actually have there? There's uh, quite a few, you know, World War I was always kind of the, the coal specialty and kind of the calling card of the aerodrome, but there's always been also 20s and 30s airplanes. They have actually two Fokker triplanes. They just got a second Fokker triplane flying. So there's actually two Fokker triplanes there now. There's a replica Albatross uh, D5 there. Uh, they've got a replica SPAD. They're mostly replicas. They have an original 1918 Curtis Jenny that they fly. But uh, in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, in the beginning, there were several original World War I airplanes that flew there. Uh, Newport 28 that's now hanging up at Udvar-Hazy Center, the part of the Air and Space Museum. They, Cole had an original SPAD that's now in the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton. So the original fighter planes have mostly stopped flying. But, uh, but they have a number of replicas. And then, of course, there's a Tiger Moth and a couple of fleets and uh, uh, various 1920s and 30s airplanes that take part in the show, too. Wow, that's really amazing. So take me back in time to like show me how you uh, became, I guess, the Andrew King of today, where you got started in this environment and was able to learn about you know how to fly and what whether whether it was this or something else that kicked off that your love of this part of aviation. Well, Rhinebeck, from a concrete standpoint, was what what did it for me, which I was involved, I mean, when I was five, six, seven years old, I was out there washing airplanes and, you know, carrying things and gopher kind of thing. My my dad and my uncle both flew there. Uh, both my dad and my uncle grew up in Western New York, obviously. They were brothers and grew up in Western New York. And they grew up in kind of a poor family, but in the 1930s, like a lot of kids, they were airplane nuts and they built model airplanes and, and uh, got into radio control and things like that uh, in the 50s. And then my uncle uh, was an art teacher and moved to Hyde Park, New York, which is near Rhinebeck, and heard about this place up the road where there were these old airplanes, and he went up and got involved. And then my dad moved to Terrytown, well, Nyack, New York, and then was a teacher over in Terrytown, which is about 70 miles south of Rhinebeck. And so my uncle said, hey, you've got to come up here and see this. And so dad went up there. So from about 1966, 67, uh, my dad and my uncle were both involved at Rhinebeck. And my dad was probably involved longer than anybody in the history of the place, even longer than Cole. Uh, Cole passed away, I think, in the early 90s, I, I think it was. And uh, uh, dad started flying there when he was around 40, and he flew till he was 80 years old. He, he stopped flying at Rhinebeck because the insurance company wouldn't insure him anymore. So he was really a big part of, a, you know, a linchpin of the, of the organization of Rhinebeck. And so from when, again, when I was five, six, seven years old, growing up there and reading the books, I, I was a big reader always been a big history nut. And in those days, in the 60s and 70s, there were still World War I pilots alive. And I got to meet Doug Campbell, who was the first US trained ace, uh, George Vaughn, 
and uh, some of the uh, some of the other World War One pilots, German World War One pilots, would occasionally show up, uh, and British pilots. And so it was, you know, it was it was for a six, seven, eight year old kid who was kind of following my father's footsteps and dreaming about flying a Sopwith or a Fokker, and to meet the guys that actually did it and be around people like Cole Palin and Dave Fox and my dad and my uncle. I, I mean, I just, like I say, you, you pinch yourself. And even at the time, I can remember being a teenager and thinking, you know, oh my goodness, this, I, how, how did I deserve this? You know, <laughs> one of the, I, I like to say, some, you know, people always say, oh, life isn't fair when something bad happens. And I like to say, sometimes life isn't fair when something good happens because you didn't deserve it, but it happened anyway. So <laughs> sometimes life isn't fair and you're on the good side of that. And I've had a lot of that. I've had a lot of life isn't fair stuff I didn't earn that I've received anyway in, in aviation. So Rheinbeck was, was a big thing like that. That's amazing. And, and did your father and your uncle and, and you all learn at Rheinbeck or was it nearby? My dad learned to fly down in Mayopac, which was further south. Uh, my uncle, I'm not sure if he learned to fly at Rhinebeck or not. I went to Hampton, New Hampshire when I was 16 because I had three Cubs, three champs, and two Cessna 170s in the flying school, and I wanted to solo in a Cub. I, my dad had a Cub uh, before that, and I had flown with my dad a little bit. Uh, I can remember when I was, I don't know, 10, 11 or so, and I couldn't reach the rudder pedals, but I could just see over the window sills, you know, and so dad would do the rudder pedals, and I would do the stick, and... So I, I had some flying experience doing that with my dad in the Cub. But when I really went to solo, I went to Hampton, uh, soloed in the Cub up there. And they still have the Cub that I soloed in, which now have, apparently has 14,000 hours on it, uh, 7006 <laughs> Hotel. But, uh, but And Hampton was a great place to learn to fly, too. It was a very kind of uh, old-fashioned and a lot of camaraderie and stuff. And it was an interesting place. And a great restaurant. <laughs> and a great restaurant. Yeah, I haven't been, I haven't been to the restaurant in many years, but uh, yep, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's it, Hampton, another classic. There's so many kind of iconic airports that are really, in a way, so connected to the old biplanes, the old types of things, just not necessarily, of course, with the show and the community and everything that Rhinebeck has. Um, but, but it seems like if you find a grass field, Katama and Martha's Vineyard, and there's ones all across the country, we're obviously just talking about New England. Um, right. It, it's... It's just such a such a wonderful concept. So, so you learned in basically in the Cub and kind of stayed in that side. Did you have an an urge at any point to uh, move towards maybe the transportation side of where things are moving faster or anything like that, or was it always this uh, comfort with the classic and the vintage and the air, antique aircraft? You know, when I, I soloed, I went to Hampton on a Wednesday, uh, soloed on a Friday, and uh, my instructor left on a, on the Monday to go work for the airlines. I got a new instructor, but uh, and as I had flown some with my dad. So, I mean, I soloed in, I don't know, five hours, something like that. But one of my, the instructor that took over the next week, uh, she had to get recurrent on instruments. So she had rented a 172 and we had another instructor and I went along with it and I took a turn flying the 172 the next week. And I put it in my logbook, and I always kind of regretted it because for like the first seven years of my flying, there was no pre-1950 airplanes except for that 172 on the very first page of my logbook. Yeah. <laughs> but, what is uh, this? You're like, yeah. I'll give up the hours. We can take right. it out. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'll forfeit but, them back to the FAA. Right, right. But, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, my dad and my uncle at the time owned a Tiger Moth in partnership. And when I was 17 years old, I sold the Tiger Moth and, uh, you know, the opportunities at Rhinebeck, obviously, I, I just, I, I've always had the opportunities to fly the older airplanes. And it's always, it's what I wanted to do. It's, uh, I, I, sometimes I go to air shows and I see somebody flying something, a P-51 or something. I think, God, I wish I'd done that. And then I think, you know, you can't complain. I had so many great <laughs> opportunities. That I just can't complain. Are there some commonalities that you 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 find between the uh, all of these is there kind of a, a little bit of a flavor or is it a little bit of the wild west with uh, all the different designs from back then most of the airplanes pre-1929 fly terrible uh, <laughs> most of them most of them are heavy on the ailerons uh, most of the elevators and rudder generally worked good a lot of them are tail heavy especially the world war one airplanes most of them are tail heavy heavy on the ailerons uh, rudders are too big. Elevators are sometimes too sensitive. Uh, you know, about 1930, 31, they started figuring stuff out, started having freeze ailerons. You get to 1932, 33, stuff starts to fly pretty good. But there was a transition between about 1928 and 1932 where airplanes went from 
kind of World War One technology as far as aerodynamics to more modern technology and started flying better. So the, like the drawing, the, the, I guess that line is when you get to the 30s. I always think of things like new, they, I think they had a new standard at uh, Hampton and certainly they they flew with uh, one of them doing rides down in uh, in, in the vineyard, as, uh, Katama as well. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the years are of those, but I always wondered, are they hard to fly? Or are they easy to fly? The new standard, it's funny you should say that because the new standard that was at Hampton, I rebuilt the wings on. Uh, I <laughs> For a guy named John Barker, north of Rhinebeck in 1986-7, and around, around the kind of mid to late 1980s, I worked for John Barker, and we got the job of rebuilding the wings for that airplane. It was owned by Mike Hart, who was one of the owners of Hampton, yep. and so we rebuilt the wings on it and covered them and uh, built new seats for it and some other things like that. Mike took it back and had uh, Craig, uh, Craig oh, shoot, I can't think of his last name, at Hampton finish it, Craig Sinclair. At Hampton finished the airplane and got it flying and they did rides on it for many years and then Mike decided to sell it and I heard about it and my friend Dewey in Ohio he was looking for a new standard and I called Dewey up and said hey there's a new standard for sale I haven't been advertised yet and so uh, Dewey sent me up there to look at it and I did a pre-purchase on it and said yeah I think you should buy it and uh, they got the deal done and I, I flew it from Hampton out to uh, Ohio and I probably got I might have a couple hundred hours in it now. I, I do a lot of barnstorming with Dewey, and we take the new standard, and he has a traveler also, and we'll take both airplanes to various events. And uh, I, I, in fact, that new standard, I, I flew 104 people in one day once in it. I think it was uh, oh uh, 30 some rides, I think, 32 rides or something like that, and uh, 104 people. So the new standard is actually a fairly easy airplane to fly. It's a 1926 design but it flies better than most 1926 airplanes. And I'm always, if, if Dewey wants to check out a new pilot, we put him in the new standard first and then the traveler because the new standard's easier to fly than the traveler. But uh, it's wow. it's kind of unique that way. It's When I do biplane rides, I, I fly also, I do fly a Waco for the Golden Age Air Museum in Pennsylvania near, uh, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I, I have my own traveler that I do rides in and Dewey's traveler. When I do biplane rides in most of those kind of biplanes, I kind of challenge myself to never move the stick more than four inches from the center. And never, once you open the throttle on takeoff, only reductions. We do 50 minute flights, basically 50 minute flights. But you can do wing overs, you can do a lot of flying in those kind of airplanes with only moving the stick four inches. The standard, it's like 14 inches. And the standard takes a lot of back and forth. It does, it does take a lot of control movement to make stuff happen. But uh, really for, for what it is, it's a pretty good flying airplane. I, I think a lot of people uh, aren't necessarily familiar with the idea that many of these very, very early aircraft, or at least in the 20s, if one used very, very early, um, part of their job was to take people up. And so they right. were, they, they had a lot more room than you might think. Tell, it, can you talk a little bit about the fact that some of these, I know they're bigger airplanes than people might think, and they actually can carry a fair number of people. Well, with the, the Travelers and Wacos uh, and other biplanes at the time, almost all of them were designed with wide front cockpits so you could put, fit two people in the front cockpit. Uh, they, they realized no matter what you were doing, passenger carrying, even if you're carrying mail, the more room you had, the better. But uh, almost all of them fit two people in the front cockpit, and so they're good for barnstorm. The guys with the Stearmans, I also fly Stearman doing Stearman rides. And uh, it's good because we do aerobatic rides. We do a U-flight experience. We have the, the front stick in. But uh, not being able to carry two airplanes and the same engine, uh, you know, you, you really you can increase, increase your profit if you have a Traveler or a Waco that can carry two people at once. And then the new standard, the, really the only purpose for the new standard was to carry passengers. And it carries four passengers plus the pilot. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a, there's a great big front cockpit in front of you. And, uh, but visibility is not too bad out of it. You know, the old biplanes uh, are pretty blind but the new standard isn't too bad to sit fairly high but it's something to be up there with four passengers in there and uh, you know usually having a great time they can talk to each other they have to yell but they can talk to each other because everybody's still pretty tight in the 1920s and 30s of course people were you know average height was probably 5'9 or 5'10 or something and people were 150 160 men were 150 160 so if you get two 200 pounders or four 200 pounders it's tight in the biplanes but uh, but but still it's it's a lot of fun having two or having four people up in front of you. Wow. What is the oldest aircraft that you've, you've flown? Tell me a little bit about that experience. Probably the Curtis Jennies. Uh, I've flown uh, seven different Curtis Jennies. Uh, again, it's, 
I think it's one of my few aviation records, but I, I doubt there's anyone else that's flown seven different Curtis Jennies, but I've just been in the right place at the right time. Uh, people knew that I had flown other Jennies, so they either let me fly theirs or call me up to do a test flight on a Curtis Jenny or something. But the, the Jennies, it's possible that one of them might have been built in 1917. Most of them were built in 1918. So the oldest original airplane uh, would have been one of the Curtis Jennies, either 1917 or 1918. And then I have about 60 or 70 hours in a replica 1911 Curtis Pusher that a friend of mine built uh, for 2011. It was a replica of the Navy's first airplane that was flown by Eugene Ely, first airplane to land on a ship and take off from a ship. They built a platform on, a, on the front of a cruiser over the turrets, and he landed and took off in San Francisco Bay. So that's kind of the beginning of naval aviation was, uh, was in 1911. My friend Bob was a retired Navy pilot and uh, had flown S2s and uh, S3s, and uh, the centennial was coming up and trying to think of something to do, and we, we finally came up with a plan to build a replica 1911 Curtis, the Navy's first airplane, and so Bob did 99% of the work probably on it. I helped a little bit here and there and a few other people helped, but, uh, but he built it and then he and I and, uh, and another guy shared the flying duties and uh, the, Navy was, the Navy was really good to us in 2011. I flew it into Pax River, uh, one of the coldest flights I've ever been on. I think it was April and oh my God, it was cold going into Pax River. But uh, the, it was on a Sunday morning and the, the base CO came zooming out in the van to meet me when I landed on the runway and stuff. And, uh, got to fly around in front of the officers club. I got to, we did the Navy, the Blue Angels homecoming show in the spring in 2012. And they wanted air to air footage of the Curtis Pusher over the museum and over the waterfront and stuff and over the base, over the Naval Air Station. And so Bob did the flights out over the bay and in front of the, the city of Pensacola. And I did the flights over the Naval Air Station. And I said, well, what's the rules? You know, I mean, it's, just the Navy, it's not kind of not the FAA, you know, and they said, do whatever you want. So I went down Admiral's Row at about 200 feet in this 1911 Curtis. I went past the officer's club right on the water, about 10 feet off the water, right past the officer's club, circled around the control tower. You know? <laughs> I don't think anybody's beat up NAS Pensacola like that since uh, Frank Tallman did it for the movie back in 1950. I can't remember the name of the movie, it was about a guy named Spig Weed, but... Uh, but yeah, I think since the 1950s, I probably have the prize for beating up NAS Pensacola in the 1911 Curtis. Oh my goodness! And that was in the in the Curtis Pusher to to do yeah. all that flight. That is not. I can't imagine that that's an easy plane to fly. Uh, and people, it's, people always ask me, "What's the worst airplane you ever fly?" And I always tell them before I answer, I say, "Okay, I'm, I'll tell you the answer, but I want you to know I loved every minute of it." But the Curtis Pusher probably was the worst flying airplane. The, the the ailerons were very heavy, very slow. Uh, the elevators were, well, the rudder was kind of normal. Ailerons very heavy. The elevators had absolutely no feedback. Were extremely sensitive and extremely powerful. So the elevator was one of the one of the biggest problems in flying it. And I told people, in, in calm winds, wasn't too bad. In five mile an hour, wasn't too bad. If the wind was blowing ten miles an hour or more, if you flew for more than half an hour, you'd be scared at some point. That was that was what I told people because I mean the, the wake turbulence from a Piper Cub would almost knock it out of the sky. It was just it was very unstable. Uh, the control force is very unharmonized. It, it, it was really I mean it was 1911, early, early, early in the engineering. Obviously, it was great for the people at the time. It was an advancement for the people at the time. But with the perspective we have nowadays. Yeah, th that was probably the worst flying airplane that I've flown. It's amazing how fast things were moving or evolving during that time period. When you look at from the Wright brothers to the to 1910, 1911, from then the, in the teens to, to 1920, 20 to 30. Right. I, it, 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 tell me a little bit about what you've experienced for those different kind of eras uh, and what that means to the planes that you fly today. Well, war is always a catalyst for progress, you know, in, in a lot of different uh, technological uh, sciences. And aviation obviously is no exception. The, the, at the beginning of World War I, 1914, they had Blerios, they had the Curtis Busher types, you know, firemen's and, and short box guide biplanes and stuff. And, you know, the, after a little while in the war, they start taking pot shots at each other's with the 45 they carried in their holster on their hip. and. Uh, finally started bolting machine guns on airplanes and things. But uh, the, the difference between 1914 airplanes and 1918 airplanes, the 1918 airplanes, especially like the Fokkers, the Fokker D7 and the Fokker D8 are not out of place in 1929. 
and they were 1917, 1918 design. So Fokker was a very advanced company. Uh, SE5 wasn't bad, but the, the Fokker was really advanced. They had the thick airfoils, cantilever wings, steel tube fuselages. As I say, they, a lot of air forces used them into the late 20s because they were such an advanced design from 1918. But so there was a big advancement from 1914 to 1918. Uh, after that, there, it was slow again, as again in the post-war uh, situation, often the technology stops progressing as much because there's no need for it. And, uh, uh, you know, World War II, obviously, again, was a big catalyst. Again, the airplanes they had in 1939 compared to at the end of 1945, they had jets. So, mm. uh, so that wars tend to be a big catalyst of that. Uh, you know, the exploration, Lindbergh and long distance flights and, and things like that, exploration, flying over the poles and things like that tends to uh, contribute to the technology. But uh, everything, you know, everything got faster. Monoplanes became more prevalent and mm -hmm. uh, to say they figured out how to make things fly better, how to make the ailerons work better and uh, balance how important center of gravity and balance was and those things. So that 1930s airplanes were way better than 1920s airplanes. Uh, 1940s airplanes were better than 1930s airplanes. Uh, there's a constant progression. Tell me a little bit about the the triplane because uh, the 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 Fokker. I mean, that seems to be the most iconic from you know uh, uh, coming all the way from Snoopy all the way forward, and then right. seeing it. I mean, that if there's one thing that you look at and you go, how does that fly, or how hard is that thing to fly? That seems to me to be next to the next to something like the pushers or the right planes. That seems to be the one I look at and I go, oh, my God. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Charles Schultz, for Snoopy and the Red Baron for making it popular, because that was a big part of uh, how people knew about the Red Baron. But uh, the triplane is a very capable airplane for its time. Uh, and the, another, you know, most airplanes pretty much anybody can fly them at a thousand feet. It's the takeoff and landing where the bread and butter is. And the triplane is very much like that. And the triplane, the big thing is you can't see anything when the tail's down. When the tail's down on the triplane, the middle wing is above the horizon. So from wingtip to wingtip, you, you can basically see nothing. And uh, there's two little cutouts right next to the fuselage in the middle wing. And you can kind of look down at an angle, maybe a 30 degree angle through those little cutouts. But it's just, it's very, very blind, it's very short coupled, it's very top heavy, all the things working against it uh, from staying straight. So uh, it, it's, it, it's certainly one of the more challenging airplanes that I've flown. And I, I, again, I kind of tell people it's, it's not that much fun, but I love it, you know, because, oh my God, you're flying a Fokker triplane. Once you get it in the air, uh, you know, it's very maneuverable and it's sitting, a lot of the thing about the old airplanes to me is kind of the uh, the environment you're in or the the uh, there's a lot of times when I wish I, you know I wish all the people I wish I had a Fokker triplane I could just let everybody fly it because to sit in it and see that view and see those three wings and the camouflage and guns right in front of you the world the World War One airplanes with guns right in front of you you know you sit in a World War Two airplane and it's a war plane but you, it's not that visceral where in a World War One airplane there's guns you know a foot from your face and it, it makes a clear message that these things were designed to go to war to shoot down other airplanes and uh, you know people got killed uh, uh, in combat in these things and so that that there, there, it, it gives you a, a kind of a perspective on you read the books now and it gives you a different perspective on reading the books and about being in combat and things like that but the you know the triplane it's there's a lot of myths about the triplane like there's the myth about that it could uh, make a, a flat turn without banking and a kind of a snap 180 degree flat turn. And that's, that's just totally untrue. That doesn't, it won't do it. It'll, it'll yaw very hard about 30 or 40 degrees, but it keeps going in the direction it was going. And if you try to make a 360 degree turn, it takes about twice as long if you don't bank. I, I've tried it to see, you know, you hear that I've read about these legends and I, well, I'm going to try that. The first time I flew a Fokker triplane, I went up there and I jammed on the rudder to see what would happen. And it started kind of slewing around, but very slow, you know, it, it, so uh, it, it, you kind of dispel some of that. People still won't believe it. Well, those British pilots saw it. You know, they said it would do it. They saw it. Well, you know, they were 22-year-old kids at 18,000 feet trying not to die. And sometimes you see things and they look like something, but it's, it's aerodynamically impossible, you know. So that's, that's another interesting part of it, to have that perspective and be able to talk about it. 
Wow. No kidding. And, and the, I mean, pe- I don't know, what were the trainers back then? Was it really that people would go straight into Jenny's and that was kind of what got you towards, I'm, I'm not even a hundred percent you know, sure on the, on the evolution of which existed at which different times. Yeah, a lot of in World War One, uh, a lot of pilots started in Jennies. A lot of the the Canadians had Jennies, and they bring them. They had training bases in the U.S. because the weather was better. Uh, in England, they had the BE2, which was very similar to a Jenny. Uh, so they they had Jenny style aircraft. Avro 504 was one of the biggest trainers in England, also. And so you would start in that, but you know they were kicking them out of the nest early. I mean, a lot of pilots with 20 hours were hopping in a sock with pup or a spat or something like that. And I think that's a lot of the rotary engine. We were talking about rotary engines earlier, and that's another one where there's kind of myths about the rotary engine. And oh my God, the gyroscopic force is 350 pounds of steel spinning around on the front of the airplane. And you could, your, your, they, the rumor, the legend has it, you can make a 270 degree right turn faster than you can make a 90 degree left turn, which is completely baloney. You know, it's uh, the first time I flew one, I was flying around, I thought, Wow, I didn't even notice the gyroscopic force, and I put my feet on the floor and started moving the stick around, and then you could, you could see it affecting the airplane. But I think a lot of those legends and myths and stuff come because a 20-hour pilot gets in the sock with pup with a rotary engine, he doesn't automatically compensate for that. Where you know the 300-hour, 400-hour guys, like the sock with camel, had a very bad reputation. They supposedly more crashed than got shot down in combat, and they're very short coupled, uh, very tail heavy and uh, supposed to be very tricky to fly, but the guys that had been flying pups in combat, they got stopped with camels. They loved them because they knew how to use the, the, the effects of the rotary engine, and they, they automatically compensated for, for the negative things. So, uh, so that's, that's another interesting thing about flying the old stuff is uh, seeing, seeing, whether, seeing what's myth and what's not. Yeah, let's explain to people what a rotary engine is, because, I mean, we think about it, of course, on the automotive side, it's a completely different thing. But right. it's not radial, uh, uh, although it is a radial. But It's a radial a, rotary, yeah. It's a radial engine, but the entire engine, right, is what spins? Right. Yes, the modern rotary that people think of as the Wankel rotary, it's a rotary piston. It's kind of a triangular-shaped rotary piston, nothing at all like World War I. In the early days of aviation, one of the big problems they had was cooling engines, and that's why there was a lot of liquid-cooled engines. Air-cooled engines weren't so good because they couldn't cast or machine enough cooling fins on the cylinders for them to cool adequately. And somebody came up with a bright idea, well, if we spin the whole engine, it'll cool itself. And... You know, it's it seems counterintuitive now, but it, there's a certain amount of genius to it. And so they fixed the crankshaft and let the whole engine spin around the crankshaft. And, of course, it created other problems. Ignition, how do you get ignition to it? How do you get fuel and air to it? So on the rotary engine, the crankshaft is hollow, and the fuel and air is introduced at the back of the crank, of the hollow crankshaft, goes up, and it's just – it's the fuel is sprayed out just into the crankcase – and then uh, they have different ways of getting it into the cylinder. On the Lerone engines, there's copper pipes that go from the crankcase up to the cylinder. I had to let the fuel-air mixture in. Uh, the, the Gnome engines actually have uh, holes in the bottom of the, the uh, cylinder where the piston uncovers the holes, and the fuel-air mixture goes in through the holes, similar to a two-stroke, but they're not. They're four-stroke engines. But the, So that's where some of the way they solve the problems of getting fuel and air into the uh, engine. And then, of course, the oil, they can't sep- the oil has to go into the crankcase, too, and they, so it can't really be separated from the fuel air. So it's a one-way oil system. And of course, <clears throat> excuse me, the castor oil, they use castor oil because it's less likely to, uh, to break down with the fuel in it than uh, regular mineral oil. So that was one of the reasons they use castor oil. Castor oil also has a high surface tension. They were roller bearing engines or ball bearing engines. Uh, the, most of the main bearings in the rotors were ball bearings. And the, so the castor oil was good for ball bearings. Uh, there's a lot of little uh, you know, facets of, of rotary engines like that. The, the ignition, they had a magneto that was sort of like a one-cylinder magneto, and then they had a big disc, a uh, micarta disc, bolted to the back of the engine with brass contacts in it, and that became the distributor. So they had sort of a one-cylinder magneto, but it would fire through, the, through a brush in the firewall, and the back of the engine was its own distributor, and every time it came across the brass contact, it would fire to that cylinder. So uh, very interesting there. There interesting to fly and control. Uh, I haven't flown an 80 Lerone yet, which is one of the more common ones, but I have a friend with a Thomas More Scout in California that we're just about ready to fly. Uh, probably will test fly that in October uh, when I get back out there. And so, and, and John, who owns the Fogar Triplane that I've been flying the last couple of years, has sent it to a guy in Pennsylvania named Fred Mern, who's the expert on rotary engines, and they're putting a rotary engine on that. So we'll have a rotary engine Fogar Triplane soon here in Virginia. 
uh, to try out. So I'm looking forward to that also. Was that, was the Fokker triplane originally a rotary? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Originally had a, a 110 horsepower Oberussel, which was sort of a copy of the French Lerone. Uh, it's uh, 110 horsepower, I think it's 800 and some cubic inches. So it's, uh, it's a lot, all the old engines, big cubic inches, low RPM, lots of foot pounds of torque. But wow. same thing with the, the, the 80 Lerone, I think is 600 and some cubic inches. I believe the 110s were, uh, were over 800 cubic inches. That the, eventually at the end of the war, the biggest rotary engine was a 230 horsepower Bentley that they used on Sopwith Snipes. But at that point they were just too big. You had 500 pounds of metal spinning around on the front. It was just, it was the end of the technology. They had to start figuring out how to make uh, better cooling fins and things so they could have stationary radials. That's that's amazing. You know, the other thing that seems to as as a, a viewer uh, to be really interesting about some of the older aircraft, you hear them start and stop all the time. Tell me a little bit about that concept of how engines are managed compared to you know a throttle. Why do we hear the engines start and stop so much? Yeah, this is another one of the sort of myths about rotary engines. The people say, oh, they had no throttle. They were all on or all off. The 100 horsepower gnome was all on or all off. You couldn't adjust. You adjusted the fuel mixture for whatever it was going in, and then you just flip it on and off. All of the Lerone engines have a carburetor on the back of the crankshaft. It's kind of a rudimentary. It's a slide valve carburetor with a big slide valve on it. It has a big needle connected to it that goes into the fuel orifice, so it meters the fuel also. It's kind of a, a rough carburetor. You have a fine adjustment. Uh, lever that's kind of a fine adjustment on the mixture also, but the Clergés, the Lerones, the Oberussels, almost all rotary engines actually are quite throttleable, but they, a lot of them won't throttle down enough to really be at idle when you're landing. And so you have the blip switch on the stick, just a button on the stick that cuts out the magneto. And so for really for landing is about the only time you're landing and taxiing around is the only time you should be doing the on off switch. Most of the rest of the time you should be able to throttle it enough. But a lot of, some people do that because it sounds cool, you know, and. Uh, it's like revving a motorcycle engine. See, aviation, classic antique aviation equivalent of doing that, I guess. Right, right, yep, yep. That's, yep. you know, it, and that makes a lot of sense, of course, because as an audience or watching one of these shows or growing up from Rhinebeck, you are mainly seeing the aircraft up close when they are landing, taxiing, things like that. Right. And that's that scenario where you're talking about where you'd want to use that technology. Right. Yep. Exactly. And that's just because otherwise you're going to have too much power when you're right. It's a, you drain great big prop, even turn it 800 RPM. That big old prop will still pull the airplane through the air. So if you can blip it a little bit and uh, cut it on and off and get it down to 600 RPM, then then you slow down quite a bit more. Wow. That's that's very very cool. So let's talk about some of the other really cool planes. Now I, I also have some photos here that I want to make sure that uh, I get to hear a little bit from from and this is a wonderful one right here yeah i like that picture i'm about i think i'm about seven or eight years old uh, at rhinebeck uh, late 1960s and sitting on the wheel of the original spad that's now in the air force museum uh that kind of captures the how cool it was to grow up at rhinebeck that's just just absolutely amazing uh, this was a photo shoot we did out over the Hudson River. That's my uncle flying the, the replica Sopwith Dolphin with a Hispano Suiza engine, and that's me in the Fokker triplane uh, chasing after him. And then this is, that was 1992. Uh, I was working for Kermit Weeks down in Miami, and I got a phone call from some friends of mine in St. Louis, and they got a smoking deal on a Waco UPF-7, but it was in Wasilla, Alaska. And the story I was told was that there was a bunch of them sitting around in a room in St. Louis, and they said, man, we got a great deal on this airplane. We got to buy it, but how are we going to get it back? And the story I was told was somebody said, call Andrew up. <laughs> and so I was in Miami. I got a phone call. Hey, uh, you want to go to a lot? Actually, it was John Alterman. He said, you want to go on a big adventure? Yeah, of course. What is it? You know, well, you go to Alaska and pick up a Waco UPF-7 and fly it back here to St. Louis. So... Uh, so I hopped on Northwest, flew up to Anchorage. It was June uh, 5th, 6th, 7th, sometime around early June when I picked it up. The airplane, I went out to the airplane. It turned out it was one of the rattiest airplanes I've ever flown. It had been tied down outside in Alaska for like six years. Uh, it had duct tape on it that had been on it for so long. There was white dope over the duct tape. Uh, the fabric, the paint was cracked on the side of the fuselage. Sunlight would shine on your leg as you were flying along. And I mean, it was... It was long in the tooth, but it flew hands off. It flew great. You know, it was a, it was an eight day trip, and I flew seven days, uh, 36.6 hours, and just about 3,600 miles. 
and I got it back to St. Louis. One of the, probably the most epic cross-country trip that I've done is the, is the Waco trip from Alaska. That's amazing. I mean, and I think what on earth is an open cockpit aircraft doing in Alaska? <laughs> right. I know. You wonder. That's right. That's right. And of course, in the summertime, it's warming up. And it, and it was in the 50s, probably, down around Anchorage at that point. But once you got up into the interior, Northway and crossing into the Yukon, and you can see in that picture, snow-covered mountains, and it was it got cold. It was down in the 30s a lot of the trip till I got into some, kind of southern Canada, Saskatchewan, and, and down into southern Canada but spectacular. I mean, you're flying along and there's 17,000 foot mountains next to you. And I mean, it's just, you know, just spectacular. That's, a, that's absolutely amazing. There's some more, some more here as well with stories. I love this one. Yeah, that's everybody. I sent you that because people like that, that picture. My friend Dewey is known for doing that right side up. He has a lot of pictures, barnstorming and stuff in his traveler and his new standard, holding his hands up over his head like that. And I was flying the traveler. I guess I was a little bored and I started thinking, I if I trim this thing back, and I can do a loop and let go of the controls at the top and get this picture. I, I do quite a bit of stuff with the GoPro and I had the GoPro mounted. So uh, it's a screenshot from a video to, to get it exactly the right point. But uh, yeah, that was a very, that's one of my more popular Instagram photos. I absolutely love that. Uh, that's my mom and dad, my mom in the middle and my dad on the right there. I mean, that's a, a 1930 fleet that I owned for a few years. And uh, so, so mom and dad who, who get a lot of the credit for where I'm at, uh, them posing with me with the with the 1930 fleet. Uh, this is over Oshkosh. Uh, this is, there was a museum, uh, is a museum uh, in uh, north of Denver in Colorado that is a specializes in World War One aviation. And we th flew these three airplanes from Colorado to uh, Oshkosh one year and did this photo shoot over the lake with the Cessna 210 with Bruce Moore and Jim Kepnick. And uh, I'm flying the uh, the black and yellow uh, Fokker D8 monoplane at the far end there, I'm flying that, and then uh, Bob Kubel is flying the Fokker D7 in the middle, and uh, Mark Holliday is flying the Fokker triplane. Wow, and so all, all Fokker aircraft, and I, I love how the older World War I planes, uh, or that era, they're painted so colorfully, so dynamically, it is, I mean, that's a pretty wild paint job on the one that's, on the one you were flying. Yeah, it's, it was a German thing. The, the Allies kind of frowned on that. The, the Allied leadership kind of frowned on that, but the Germans allowed more individualism of their pilots, and it was it was a little bit of like the red cape to the bull. It was kind of a challenge that we you know we don't we don't want to be camouflaged. We want you to see us and come fight. So it was a it was kind of a, a challenge thing. That's really really interesting, and I of course love this. Tell me about this airplane because the stitching on the side yep, sure, yep. sure dates the plane. That was a common, uh, mostly in England, uh, they, they had the fabric stitched on like that because if they had any battle damage or any other maintenance they had to do inside the fuselage, they just unlaced the fabric and then lace it back up when they were finished working on it. Uh, it's a replica 1917 Bristol fighter that's up at Rhinebeck. And uh, I was there uh, last year, I uh, went up to uh, do the annual inspection of my brother's Tiger Moth and uh, they, had a, they have an annual fundraising gala and I happened to be up there. And I, they had just gotten the airplane and I wanted just, just to sit in it to, uh, you know, see what the view looked like. And I'd never, never been in a Bristol fighter before. It was a very classic uh, airplane in World War, World War I. They introduced them at first and the first squadron that went up, I think they sent six of them up and five got shot down. And the, this is another airplane of myth and legend where you read all the old books. And this is, this is one of the more, uh, the legends that's harder for me to, to come to grips with because the story is that, well, then they learned to fly them like a fighter. And then they could dogfight with Fokker D7s and stuff. Instead of flying them like a regular two-seater, fly them like a fighter. So I was up at Rhinebeck, and I sat in the thing just to sit in. You know, we like sitting in cockpits. And uh, Clay Hammond, the, the chief pilot up there, came up, and he said, uh, hey, you want to fly it? And they'd only flown it twice. It was still in the test flying stage. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, I'm not going to turn that down. So I flew it on its third test flight. But... Oh my God, that thing would be sitting duck for a Fokker D7. I can't imagine how they, you know, but the, in the books they talk about dog fighting with Fokker D7s and the, 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 oh, the ailerons are heavy and slow and it, it just, it would be a sitting duck for any Albatross or Fokker D7. So it's one of those stories that's kind of hard for me to connect to. The, the, that's what they say in the books and those guys, they claim they, you know, there were Bristol fighter aces that shot down German airplanes and stuff. And the, the airplane has a Ranger engine in it, so it's a smaller engine than the original Rolls-Royce V12. But I've heard that even the guys that fly the original ones with the V12 engines in it think the same thing. I would not want to take on a Fokker D7 with this airplane. 
maybe the only way that they won was the first guy has to be the sitting duck. <laughs> it's the guys coming in from the behind that get to shoot down the, the right, the right. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But but again, a fantastic, cool airplane to fly a Bristol fighter. Just I mean, it's just a fantastic experience. And I love that idea that that it was just meant for a quick replacement of the different panels. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Or working like I say, if there was battle damage or something like that, you just unlace the fabric and lace it back up again. Wow, that's uh, that's that's pretty wild. This is the 1911 Curtis Pusher flying over Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Uh, we did a, a event up at uh, Lockheed Martin. The very first Martin airplane was basically a copy of a Curtis Pusher, and so we uh, we made a little thing that went that covered over where it said Curtis on the airplane and wrote Martin on it and went up and landed it up at the airport near where Lockheed Martin's headquarters is up uh, north of Baltimore did an event there and then we had to fly it back down. So uh, I had the first leg, which was going near uh, uh, Fort McHenry. And so we had a 172 go along with the cameraman in it and got this picture flying over Fort McHenry. So that wow. was cool. Also flew it over the Statue of Liberty on my birthday that year. Really? Yeah, we flew out of Floyd Bennett Field. They let us go and land on Floyd Bennett Field, which of course has been closed for years, but they let us land there and operate from there and got to fly over the Statue of Liberty and uh, you know, it was uh, another fantastic experience. Amazing, amazing. Um, and then this, this is that's a Curtis Jenny that was, yeah, that's a 1918 Curtis Jenny that was restored by Ken Hyde and uh, here in Warrington, Virginia, and uh, was purchased by a guy named Rick Manti down in uh, South Carolina. Uh, they took it down and uh, put it together in Chiraw, South Carolina. A guy named Wendell Hall was a fantastic uh, restoration guy and maintenance guy and. Uh, uh, pilot and everything. Wendell put the airplane together and with the help of one of the guys from Virginia. And then I went down there and test flew it several times. I did uh, I did a cross country in that airplane from Chira to Camden, which I think was 50 miles and took an hour and 15 minutes, I believe. Uh, had quite a headwind on it. But uh, the the for the second flight, uh, we had a woman named Angela Sells come down who was based in Charlotte because I really wanted to get air to air of the airplane. And uh, she came down, had a friend with a champ, and we did some air to air and got this picture. So it's a picture by Angela Sells. So cool. Now, this, of course, is another uh, uh, fun one. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I always wonder when I send that picture to people. But uh, it's kind of an aviation tradition. If you've seen the movie The Great Waldo Pepper, it's kind of an old aviation tradition, something we always did at Rhinebeck. But uh, guys in dresses, you know. And this is at the Golden Age Air Museum in Bethel, Pennsylvania, uh, east of Harrisburg. And we have we wanted to have a women's air race, but we didn't have any women pilots. We need Heather to come up there, but uh, we didn't have any <laughs> women pilots, so we have three very uh, very bad looking uh, uh, you know guys in dresses uh, flying the airplanes. But it's a 1927 Vili Monocoupe uh, in the background there, which I, th I think it's one of maybe two or three of those that are still flying. That's just amazing. And and talk and and by the way, Heather Penny who, who connected us, uh, uh, lucky just just fantastic person and thank you to her for for you even being here tonight and yep, um, yep. and and when we uh when you talk about amazing um you know people she is certainly one of them uh and, and a uh, biplane pilot at heart she's really a biplane pilot at heart so. i love that <laughs> yep, yep. so sort of speaking of biplane I, um there's there's one more to put up here this is when you talk unique, you don't get much more unique than this. Tell me about your experience with, with the gyro, auto gyro. Yeah, this, I tell people that the auto gyro was the only magic airplane that I ever flew because it affected people who knew nothing about airplanes. People that knew nothing about airplanes would look at it and they could tell that something's not right here. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not a normal airplane. It looks, it has a fuselage with an engine and a propeller but it has a rotor like a helicopter and it has little bitty wings and you know, it makes a weird sound and it, it just, it looks weird. It, it's always been kind of the holy grail of vintage airplanes is, the, is an auto gyro, true early fixed rotor auto gyro. Steve Pitcairn, whose father ran the company, had one back in the nineties uh, that, he, that he flew quite a bit. It's now in the EA Museum at Oshkosh. That was the last one. There was a guy named uh, Jack Tiffany near Dayton, Ohio, who always dreamed of restoring uh, an auto gyro, and he tracked this one down in Pennsylvania, and he and his crew restored it. And I was good friends with Jack and had a kind of a history of doing test flying of airplanes and stuff. 
And so they asked me if I would do the test flights and fly it. So uh, I had to get a rotorcraft general plane rating. I went down to a guy named Dofin Fritz in Alabama who had a, the RF-2000 gyrocopter, which is a very, very, very different airplane. Uh, but there were a few things that carried over between that and the Pitcairn. But again, the Pitcairn is a completely fixed rotor. There's no control over the rotor. That's why it has the wings. It has ailerons on the wings. Uh, again, when, when you're landing, of course, you're landing at you know, 10 miles an hour or so, the ailerons do nothing. I mean, you can move the stick all around the cockpit, nothing happens. And so it has a lot of its own idiosyncrasies, no crosswind capability. If the airplane starts going sideways when you're touching down, it's going to tip over and it's going to make a big mess. Uh, so you, you had no crosswind capabilities. I've landed across runways. I've landed on taxi per perpendicular taxiways and stuff to try to stay into the wind. But uh, I, I read as much as I could about flying it before the first time I flew it. One of the interesting things was uh, Steve Pitcairn uh, had flown his in the 90s. He died less than a year before we flew the airplane. Steve died. Uh, there was a guy named John. Hundred and I think it was 105. Uh, he had flown this auto gyro in the 30s, and he was very famous for flying autos in the 30s. He died less than a year before we flew the airplane. And so I told everybody after I had flown it the first time, now I knew the questions to ask, but there was nobody to ask the questions of. Uh, so we kind of had to figure some of it out on our own. But it was just, I mean, it was uh, the first few flights, I told people it was, it was like a pterodactyl, a prehistoric pterodactyl, came down and grabbed you and flew you away. There was a lot of flapping stuff going on above your head and you weren't really sure what was going on. You know, it was just very, uh, very unique experience. Uh, we, we took it to Oshkosh. It was a reserve grand champion at Oshkosh. It was, was a very nicely done airplane, but just a, a lot of unique characteristics. It had a little uh, kind of a, a motion to it when you first took off. I, I thought when I started going cross country to Oshkosh, it only went about 65 miles an hour and had a fairly short range. But uh, at the end of a leg, I was, it seemed like the vibration would go away or, or the motion would go away. And I finally realized my body was just getting in tune with it. And so <laughs> you know, it, was, it seemed like it was going away, but it's, it wasn't really. It, it just it had its own thing. But as I say, people that knew nothing about airplanes would look at it and they were just amazed by it because they could tell that thing. There's really something different about it. It's one of the, one of the top, top highlights of my flying career was flying the Autogero. Wow. So this, this is not a unique theme, uh, a, a one-off for you in flying something completely new or something that hasn't flown before or a type even that, that someone has just restored. What's that process like to approach an aircraft that's really, there's no one else that, that's going to take a shot at it? Yeah, the more experience you have, of course, the more, like people sometimes come to me and say, you know, I want to build a Fokker triplane. I, I, you know, what do I do to prepare myself to fly a Fokker triplane? And I tell them all the different experiences you can have will help you. If you have a helicopter rating, I think will help you fly a Fokker triplane. If you have an instrument rating, I think will help you fly a Fokker triplane. Every little thing that, that adds another tool in your toolbox uh, will, will help you in any task. And so the test flying thing is kind of like that. I have a lot of experience with that kind of airplane. And so I'm not really likely to be surprised by anything in a 1920s, 1930s airplane. Uh, it might be a little more of this or a little less of that, but it's not going to be something probably completely new that I've never dealt with before. What about from the mechanical perspective? So when you fly out, you mentioned you've got a couple of missions coming up. So when you fly out somewhere, you're handling not just the, the flight, taking it home, all this, but also the mechanical aspect of it. It seems to me as a, as a mechanic that it's almost a different world of maintenance where how things used to be done, how it, everything from, from flying wires to turnbuckles to even how safety was done. There's, there's totally different ways of doing things than what we would uh, look up in, in aircraft spruce and, and find right, a part right. for yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, the old engines, I mean, a lot of them are more sensitive to having the valves adjusted more often than, than on a modern engine. Uh, a lot of the old engines are what we call greaser engines. didn't have oil flow to the upper arms and stuff, and you have to grease the uh, actual cylinder heads, the intake and the upper arms and stuff. Every five or ten hours, you have to carry a grease gun with you and, and actually grease the cylinder heads every five or ten hours. You have to squirt oil on the valve stems to try to lubricate the valve stems. Just I flew a 1927 Waco from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina to Broadhead, Wisconsin, and I, I got down there 
uh, airplane hadn't flown in uh, I think uh, six or seven years again. Uh, they had put a fresh engine on it back around 2016, 2017, but the owner lost his medical, so the airplane had never flown and been sitting, had a zero-time engine on it, but we didn't know how good it was. Well, I took off, and it looked like it, it looked like it had a smoke system on it. It was trailing smoke, and you know, I wasn't up for very long. It started fouling spark plugs, and I had to come back down. And you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, the, the antique airplane ferrying business. Uh, I tell people there's kind of two sides to it. On the one hand, I would almost do it for nothing because the experiences that I've had uh, flying over, my two favorite places to fly over, Arizona, New Mexico. I love flying over Arizona, New Mexico. The sights I've seen and the people I've met, I'd almost do it for nothing. The other side is you almost can't pay me enough because <laughs> you're in somebody else's extremely valuable, extremely rare antique airplane. You know, you arrive over some airport in the middle of nowhere you've never been to. It's blowing 25 and it's 60 degrees across the runway. You know, it's, it's, I tell people I get paid to land, not to fly cross country, I get paid to land. But uh, so I'm up in this 1927 Waco last week and the engine's obviously not, not doing well. And I landed, we thought, well, we'll try. It's the first flight that it's had since it was overhauled and it's been sitting for six years. We cleaned all the spark plugs, try it again. I could tell 15 minutes, not gonna, not gonna do it. So the owner who was selling it happened to have a spare engine that had 30 hours on it that uh, was there in the hangar that had been flying on the airplane up until they put this other engine on. So let's put that one on. And we started that night and the next afternoon we had engines swapped. I went up and did a test flight the next night and the following morning I headed for Wisconsin. So, you know, there's, there, I've spent a lot of time, you know, en route somewhere working on stuff and uh, in a borrowed hangar and borrowed tools and, you know, having to deal with some of these maintenance issues that come up with old airplanes. One day engine swap. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What is so? So the one of the things that does impress me is a, a lot of older aircraft uh, are surprisingly like good, like better than people would imagine, more capable right. than people would imagine. Um, uh, what's like an aircraft that you think back on, or that you fly on a regular basis that you think this thing has, you know, modern capabilities? It's just it's impressive in what it actually can do. Right. Well, you know, the, the one thing I mentioned before, the Fokker D7 and Fokker D8 designed in 1918 still would have fit right in 1929, 1930. That's pretty interesting. Uh, my personal favorite airplane, I, I have a Booker Youngman with a 180 hood like homing on it instead of the original four cylinder. The, the Booker is out of the 150 some types, it's easily my number one type. Uh, I, I've gotten into a thing where if I fly an airplane, people say, one to 10, how much? When I, I did a test flight on a low-wing Aranka, and they said, I don't want to 10, how much? And I said, oh, probably a five, and they were all disappointed. And so now I get that a lot. If I fly something new, all right, one to 10, what was it, you know? But the Booker is a 10. Uh, it's a 1934, 35 design. Uh, it, it just, oh my God, it flies so nice and capable of a lot of aerobatics and a good looking airplane and the Booker is by far my favorite airplane and it's the one that I would never sell. I think that's what Lucky says as well. That's her favorite. Uh, right. She's got one. Yep. Yep. In fact, I did the condition inspection on it just recently. Yep. Yep. But uh, yeah, the, the Booker just, uh, it's the, it's the standard of old airplanes. I've gotten, in, I got in a fight with a Pitts guy one time. Oh no, a Pitts is the best fly. No, 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 no. You don't understand. A Pitts is very <laughs> capable, but it's not really a nice flying airplane. You know, I tell people a Pitts is like riding a wild Mustang horse, uh, you know, the, but the Booker is like dancing with the prettiest girl in the room. And I like them both. If I was going to own one, I want to dance with the prettiest girl in the room. <laughs> so, so that's the Booker. That's the Booker to me. It just, it's very pleasant. It's very balanced. It's easy to fly. If the landing gear is set up right, they land pretty easy. It's just, to me, it's the best bike plane ever built. And, and what year is that? And they were designed in, I think, 34, 34, 35 was the design. Mine was built in 54 in Spain. They used them in Spain as primary trainers up into the 70s, I believe, or at least 1970. Was, if you would join the Spanish Air Force in 1968, you learned to fly in a Booker Youngman. That's, that's, that's really impressive. So, yeah. um, you know, people love stories, and I, and I don't want you to leave without a couple of the nail biters that you've had. And I know you've, <laughs> you've lost some things along the way, airborne. To give us a couple things that uh, that that are memorable experiences that you're glad you walked away from. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, I wish I wasn't able to compare this, but I can. I usually tell people losing part of a prop is a lot worse than losing the whole prop. I've done both. 
and losing part of the prop is uh, is bad. I was ferrying a, a 1941 Fleet 16 from uh, Southbridge, Massachusetts to Florida, and uh, went up there. I, I had never met the guy before, so was, but he'd heard of me and called me up and yeah, sure, no problem. It was December, and I, I again laugh about people. It seems like people always call in December and January. Oh, I just bought a biplane and I need it moved, you know, somewhere. <laughs> but I said we'll get a few days of in the 50s. That'll be fine. So we kind of timed it. I went up, uh, flew up to uh, Bradley or somewhere up in New England, and uh, he picked me up. We went out to Southbridge, looked at the airplane. The airplane looked good. And uh, so I took off. It was a north-south runway, had a pretty good west wind, about a 90-degree crosswind. And I took off, and I thought, I'm glad I don't have to land back here. And three miles later, all hell broke loose. And the airplane started shaking like mad. And I thought, God, I haven't even gone three miles. And you know, it, it felt like the engine was going to fly off the front of the airplane. And I throttled back and I looked down. There was a little park next to a lake below me. It looked like maybe 900 feet of clear space, uh, but, but not smooth and uh, buildings and structures on. I mean, it would have wrecked the airplane, uh, but I had no choice. I started circling down towards it. And for some reason, I mean, I don't know what possessed me, but I thought, I wonder what would happen if I opened the throttle. And I opened the throttle and the vibration was less. And it doesn't make any sense because about a foot of the prop was missing. But uh, but somehow on that five-cylinder Kinner, there was some harmonic or something. I opened the throttle, the vibration went down, and then I could maintain altitude. And I looked out, and the airport was three miles away, but nothing but houses and trees. So then it's decide, are you going to try it? I go over those houses and trees because if something happens between here and the airport, you're going in the houses or the trees. But I, I finally, I decided to go back and I got back to the airport and I maintained about a thousand feet. I started to throttle back and it went crazy again. So I shut the mag switches off and I glided down and here's a 90 degree crosswind. I just thought I was glad I wouldn't have to land back there. Uh, touched down, rolled out, rolled off into the grass next to the runway. And I climbed out of the cockpit, walked around to the front and about a foot of the tip of the prop was missing. And somebody had improperly installed the, the way that prop hub is made there's a main nut that holds the hub on and then there's a jam nut that's pretty large probably three three and a half inches in diameter that screws down and jams on that and it had been improperly installed in a way that you couldn't tell looking at it and it had unscrewed and come off and taken off a foot of the prop and uh and caused all that problem i walked back into the office and the owner looked up and what are you doing here come here <laughs> But uh, it was a World War II airplane that had rubber engine mounts in it. Thank goodness. The early fleets were just solid bolts to the engine mount. If it had been an early fleet, the engine might have left the airplane. We inspected that thing for hours as close as we could. We couldn't find anything wrong with it. I called up uh, Clay Hammond at Rhinebeck because it was off their off season, and they had an identical airplane. I said, hey, can we borrow a prop? Yeah, sure. So we drove three or four hours up to Rhinebeck, borrowed a prop, came back down, put it on. The next day I flew into Florida or left for Florida. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah, so that was that was why I like to complete the trip. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's a part of prop. What about whole prop? The whole prop I was ferrying in Aronka Chief from Alabama, supposed to go to Sedona, Arizona, and uh, I flew it. I left one day, flew 450 miles up to Arkansas near the Oklahoma border. Uh, took off early the next morning and was flying along. Uh, the airplane had a spinner on it, so you know you go to pick up an airplane you're going to ferry, you you don't pull the spinner off and do that much of an inspection. The airplane had been flying. But again, somebody must have not installed the uh, big nut properly on the prop, and I was flying along. I took off the next morning, got about 18 miles. I was over the Canadian River in Oklahoma, and I started feeling a buzzing in my feet. I thought, That's strange. And then the whole airplane started to vibrate, and I put the wing down to just start banking to try to go back to the airport I'd taken off from, and then all the vibration stopped. And it's, it sounds good, but it wasn't because there was no more, you know, if I looked, <laughs> well, I think the propeller just left, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I was, I, when I fly over rivers in old airplanes, I try to stay near the edge. Anyways, I wasn't way out in the middle of the river where I couldn't make the edge, but I looked in front of me and there was a great big hay field. There was hay bales along one edge. So you could tell that the hay had been cut and it was probably pretty smooth. It had been tilled. Uh, I was able to glide to actually go past it and make a left-hand pattern or just normal left-hand pattern and, and come back around and land in this hay field. And uh, I have a glider rating, which would probably helps in those kind of situations, but uh, Glided down, landed, no damage to the airplane. Uh, the uh, insurance company wanted to tear the engine. I had full hull insurance on it. The insurance company wanted to tear the engine down, so I had to wait for them to show up and a salvage thing to show up. So I, I met the farmer and uh, ended up hanging out with the farmer for about three or four hours. And we went to lunch, and he told everybody in the restaurant, oh, this guy landed in my field. The repeller came off, and 
we got back and the insurance agent still wasn't there. So we went out to the barn and we started filling up buckets with corn and put them in the truck. And pretty soon I'm out in the fields with buckets of corn, pouring them in the troughs for the cows. I'm working on the farm, you know, to earn my <laughs> soon. And Then he, the, the insurance agent finally showed up in the salvage company. And so farmer Rick, we got in his truck and drove me to Tulsa, caught an airline flight and walked back in my door 11 o'clock that night back here in Virginia. So oh my was, goodness. Yep. Isn't that a, did they ever find the prop? I think it went in the river. I, I called the airport up and I said, if somebody walks in with a prop, it's our prop, you know, but I never heard of anybody finding it because I think the prop probably went in the river. It was a wooden prop, so it should have floated, but uh, yeah. And it's on someone's wall somewhere. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Oh, man. Well, Andrew, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Your stories are fantastic. For anyone out there who is interested in these in, in all these aircraft of this era if you ever need an aircraft to be you know moved repositioned anything like that or the absolute worldwide expert in doing this it is andrew <laughs> king <laughs> is there is there any way that you'd like anybody to reach you if they're uh, if they they need to for your services or do you 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 pretty booked up I'm, I'm, you know, fairly booked up, but, uh, you know, the more interesting it is, the more interested I am in it. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm the old barnstormer on Instagram uh, with uh, underscore between the three words. Uh, so if you look on Instagram for the old barnstormer, you can find me and be able to connect with me that way. Absolutely. Well, thank you so, so much for taking time to join us here on the show. Uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to um, meet up with you uh, at, again somewhere in person and uh, and chat some more about these wonderful aircraft. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll meet you at Oshkosh or somewhere. You never know. You got it. Thanks, and have a wonderful evening, Andrew. Thank you. You too. Okay. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time with Dick Rutan talking about the Rutan Voyager and his nonstop flight around the world with Jenny Yeager. Absolutely amazing story and, and feat, and uh, Dick will be here to, to tell the story. We'll talk about uh, so much about his life, of course, the brother of Bert Rutan, and, uh, and learn all about that. And then we're back on Tuesday, September 12th, with Phil Susi, RSO of the SR-71. Uh, uh, he's been on the show before, has wonderful, wonderful stories, and we spend a lot of quality time with him out at Air Venture this year, and I can't wait to have him back on the show. Again, to all of you, thanks so much for joining us. We're here to support you in general aviation and appreciate everything that all of you do. And I wish you all blue skies. Thank you.